And what are they? Well, uh, several. Let's take the first reason, is what you might call cognitive load. That the mind can only focus on so many things at once. And this is a particular difficulty for the novice teacher, because the novice teacher is putting a lot of their cognitive processing power into focusing upon the delivery of their lesson, the language they're using, the materials they're going to use, what they're going to do next. And so much of their attention is upon the delivery of the lesson. And because they're doing that, it's sometimes difficult for them to be scanning the environment and looking around and watching what's happening. So it's more difficult for novice in that sense. Also for novice, it's difficult because the expert can, can pick up cues from the environment, can pick up patterns, signals, noises, movements, can pick it up much more easily than a novice can. So all the cards are stacked against someone who's beginning as a teacher. That, uh, but even if you look at an expert giving a talk of some kind or a presentation, what you might find is that if they get to a point in their talk where they're really having to focus on something, really concentrate on a point, what they might instinctively do is look to the floor, look to the ceiling, look away in some way, disengage from the audience while they focus and really put all their mental energy into thinking about the issue. And then once they've done that bit of hard work, then they can re-engage with the audience and look again. So even the experts um, will, will sometimes disengage. So this is a real problem, I say, particularly for new teachers, those who are just learning, because the demands on the processing are far greater for them than for the expert. If you've taught something 20 times already, then you don't need to think so much about it as you might do when doing it for the first time. Therefore, it's easier to focus on the environment, scan, think what's going on, try and make judgments about when to intervene and when not to. So that's the first reason. Second reason is that being with it is immensely tiring. It's constantly having to multitask. So where a teacher might want, find it easier is to sit uh, by a child, lean over a child's desk, look at the child's book, talk one-on-one, -on -one, shut everyone else off, it's actually better practice but far more tiring for that teacher to, to move themselves around so that they're doing that but at the same time they can see the room, they can see what's happening, that they're tuned in, they're listening, they're watching. And, but that takes demands, physical demands, upon the teacher concerned. And sometimes we just find that difficult. And so, so we shut off the environment, in a sense, so we can take a bit of a rest. But if we do that too much, then we've got a problem. Well, the third reason, and this is the most insidious and most problematic, why some teachers don't sew within us, and this is because they lack confidence of dealing with some of the situations in classrooms. If, if we feel that we uh, are ill-equipped to deal with this large group of kids, this large group of children, we're ill-equipped to, to cope with the sort of challenges, then one of the strategies that we might adopt is actually to try and deal with individuals or small groups. To always be talking to ones or twos or small groups around the table. And in a sense what we're doing is we become myopic. We begin to hi almost hide within our own classrooms. And that's something you see quite often. That people don't want to see things anymore because then they have to deal with it. And dealing with it in a large group of 28 or 30 children can be very um, stressful. And if people don't feel confident, then they don't want to do that. So this is the most worrying kind of uh, failure to show witness when the teacher lacks that. But as soon as you start to withdraw in your own classroom and stop seeing what's happening, then I think you're going into a cycle whereby things will get worse and worse and worse. But won't it seem that the teacher is just nagging at the pupil all the time? There's a risk of that. If the teacher always reacts to everything they say, um, particularly in a verbal uh, manner, the skill of the teacher is not only to show your awareness, but to realize and calculate when is the right time to intervene and how to intervene. So in seeing, um, in seeing behavior that you don't see wholly desirable, perhaps just the fact that you've seen it, witnessed it, is sufficient for the youngster to desist in that behavior. If you do have to intervene, generally as a rule of thumb, it's best to intervene non-verbally, not say anything. Try to just make a brief eye contact, just a small facial signal to the youngster. We'll usually bring them back on task. And by doing it in this kind of almost secret manner, uh, without the other children seeing, there's less pressure upon that child to kind of react in some kind of way to, so that they, they impress their mates. So certainly, 
constantly picking up on everything you see would be an absolute mistake. But it is important you see it and the children know you've seen it. So would you say witness is an important tip for teachers? Oh, well, I don't think we should be thinking about tips for teachers. Um, Witherness isn't really a tip for teachers. What we're talking about here uh, is, is uh, one of many behaviours that teachers engage in which together accumulate to demonstrate professional expertise. And witherness is perhaps one of the core ones, but it's not something you just sort of switch on as a kind of tip. What we're looking for is the, is the professional expert. In Western society, the authority of the teacher vested in, vested in them by the state has been in decline for several decades. That now teachers authority will not come automatically because of the role they play, because of what society wants them to be. Teacher authority comes from the exercise of their professional expertise. And there are many, many behaviours which are crucially important. And with it, this is perhaps one of the most important, but these things are integrated. And the perception of the teacher as the expert professional, and this perception is what affects children's behaviour in turn, this, this, this perception is based upon a whole range of behaviours um, involving things like the ability to handle multiple events all happening simultaneously and, and orchestrating that in a way by which the, the problem is resolved, in the way by which people keep children alert, the use of, of your voice and your questioning and your movement, the way you uh, organise your routines, the way children come into the room and leave the room. Uh, the way by which you have smooth transitions in the, in the teaching process. The ways by which you demonstrate your authority through your non-verbal behaviour, through your eye contact, your gesture, your movement, your posture, and through your demonstration of your authority through your verbal communication, over your control of the dialogue, and your uh, awareness of, of the rhythms of interaction within classrooms. All these things are crucially important, and witness is just one of them. But this is one that the novice, the beginning teacher, a teacher that be, who's just commencing their career needs to have absolutely clear in their head as a skill that they need to work on and build upon.